Hi, this is Greg Kessich at the Portland Press Herald, and I'm here with Bill Nemitz and Alan Karen. And uh, well, last week we talked about the impending shutdown, and it lasted um, until about the time the podcast came out. So <laughs> let's hope that we can uh, our analysis will be a little more evergreen. Uh, but uh, boy, a lot, a lot went on in those few days. And um, rather than rehash it all, um, I kind of like to look forward and and look at. Um, what this means, what we learned about our governor and what it means for him going forward. The whole controversy about whether he was going on vacation or not and how we reported that, um, or some people tweeted that he was going on vacation and the lawmakers said that he had told them he was going on vacation and he said he had lied um, or he likes to lie to us in the media um, so that we report stories that are false and that uh, he was apparently... um, um, lying when he said that because um, uh, uh, Roger Cates revealed a, a, a answering machine tape that showed, um, boy, do I sound like I'm a million years old, uh, 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 a voicemail uh, that, that uh, showed that uh, he had actually did call Roger Cates and, and said that he was going away. And then uh, his, his office said he lied about that because Roger Cates hadn't been returning his calls. So is this a preview? <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like I'm in some kind of existential drama here, you know, like waiting for Godot. I mean, well, is this a- I'm, tr- I'm still trying to figure out if, if, if you lie and then lie about lying, does that mean you told the truth? Yeah. <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it like a double negative? Yeah. And the it way is, you can figure it out is, are you mad about the press covering your first yeah, lie or your right, second one? Right. I mean, the guy, <laughs> he... I it was I thought at the time that it was a, just simply a bargaining strategy on his part that he was threatening to leave the state and had no intention of doing so and uh, he he doesn't seem to care you know as he gets it, it really does prove that old axiom that you know a lie begets a lie begets a lie yeah. and and it just kind of fizzled out because nobody could keep track of exactly what he said or what he meant. But the fact is, uh, he never had any intention of leaving. And in retrospect, I don't think he had any intention of this uh, shutdown ever going beyond the 4th of July. Because I thought back as I was watching the, uh, I I am an expert now on the live feed from the Uh Senate and House chambers. I can watch them all the time. But I, I, as they were, you know, running those, the final budget that late that night, I remembered the week before a comment that he made that got some attention, but not a lot. But it was essentially, what's the big deal? The state's closed, you know, over mm-hmm. the Fourth of July holiday anyway. So this Friday deadline is baloney. We really have until Wednesday. And in retrospect, that's obviously the calendar he was working with. And he, you know, there was no way this thing was going to go beyond July Fourth. So assuming that this was uh, his plan all along, uh, what did he get out of it? He got the thing he likes most, which is a lot of attention. Attention focused on him, what he was saying, what he was doing. To me, that whole vacation thing was just nothing but pure, look at me. And uh, you know, and again, I think it's part of this larger pattern of his losing influence. And this was his last big shot. And uh, so now they're out running victory laps because uh, a minority group within their own party effectively manipulated uh, goals that they set up that didn't even exist in the first place. They just sort of set them up as straw men goals and, and, and got those things and, you know, they're declaring victory. But going forward, other than the veto power, it's hard to see what power he has. Mm-hmm. Well, isn't there um, an opportunity for him to, to <clears throat> do this kind of assert himself again uh, when they have a supplemental budget because they approved – spending for programs and cut revenue uh, that had been part of the original budget deal. And uh, there are a couple of places where um, spending has been identified for the uh, the first year of the biennium, but not the second. You won't have the, that will probably, I'm sure there's going to be one more big fight 
next spring. There's no question. I mean, how how else can Paul LePage go out? I mean, really, uh, right. you know, we're kicking and screaming. <laughs> the signature right, right, right. exit. But, yeah, but I think Watch the, one, the last 30 seconds the one of big uh, White Heat with James Cagney where he, like, sets fire to the, the uh, giant oil tank right. that he's standing on. You won't, the one thing, you won't, you won't have the drama of the shutdown, and that's what loomed over this whole thing this time is, you know, are they or aren't they? Will, they, will, will the government shut down or won't it? Well, it turns out it did, but it wasn't that big a mm -hmm. deal. Uh, there, there, there will be a budget next year, so it's not. There won't be this, you know, hard July first deadline, or or else everything shuts down. Um, so it's just going to be good old fashioned political head banging mm -hmm. over what things, as you said, get funded and which things don't. And uh, you know, I mean, I'm still not even clear on where this. Uh, 162 million in education fund money is going right. to come from. You know, I mean, they're saying it's going to somehow magically appear on the tax revenues, but I mean, really, there, there's a, so much that to get through this thing, so much was left undone. Well, I think a lot of it is one time money. Yeah. And um, that's just going to come back to bite the next legislature. Right. Uh, and. Um, I think some of it is is based on projection. Yeah, that, you know, that's, like, that's you know, what I'm getting. Like at. A, better, yeah. better than you know, my income is coming in better than projected. Happy times are ahead, folks. Uh -huh. Don't worry. You know, and may, that may be, that yeah. may not be. We'll just have to see. And I won't be surprised if they renege on the deal. The first chance they get on the on the extra school on the 162 program. million. I think the 162 yeah. million is still the biggest story lasting story that comes out of this. I don't think it's a four day shutdown. Well, no, and I, I that and the three percent surcharge being just tossed overboard so early in the process. When I look back on this whole budget battle, I will be forever amazed at how going in, what a big bargaining chip that was. And in retrospect, how early it was tossed aside by everyone, Democrats included, uh, to the point where it, it, was, it was completely irrelevant. Mm -hmm. throughout the whole process. It was a given there was going to be no 3%. Um, so I think that was a major accomplishment on LePage's and the Republicans' part. Although I feel like it was gone before he even got in the game. Yeah, I do too. I, mean, I, I think it, that was likely right. to be overturned. Yes. And so it was, a, it was a powerful bargaining chip that might have had no value when push came to shove, hard to say. Depends on how uh, Look, I think you. the Democrats cashed in that 3%. The right. possibility of the three percent surviving against what they hoped would be the certainty right. of one hundred sixty-two million dollars for education, but but again, I, it wouldn't surprise me that Republicans would would take that deal, get rid of the three percent, and then come circle back yeah, in say, to yeah, whittle away at the one hundred sixty-two right. and bring it down to nothing or as close to nothing as they can get, and then declare victory. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think Democrats ought to be. Uh, and I think if they try to do that, there will be a firestorm. And the bulk of those funds come in the second year of the biennium. <clears throat> yeah. I thought that um, uh, Scott Thistle pointed out, our, our state house reporter, is that, um, well, first of all, the House Republicans stuck together. Uh, enough of the House Republicans stuck together. And I don't see any indication that that's not going to continue. Uh, and uh, he doesn't need majorities, right? Um, he, um, uh, LePage can... Um, get by uh, with a strong, formidable, a formidable minority that can stop things from happening. Right. And uh, the other thing is that the core of these uh, House Republicans are people who came in with LePage in 2010 in the Tea Party wave. And they're turned out, too. Uh, so this is it for them. They, they're not building for the future. Maybe a couple of them might run for the Senate. But a, a lot of them, uh, this is their last uh, going to be their last hurrah. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are not like reevaluating uh, Paula Page. And I feel like uh, I've been writing that Paula Page is making himself irrelevant now. Well, since 2011, uh, I think it was the first time I, I thought like, oh, there's no way the Republicans are going to go for this. You know, just they're going to push him aside. He's really done it now. Yeah. 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 And, uh, Jan, and, the, and I've been yeah. wrong every time. So now I'm going the other way. Yeah. And I'm saying that this is going to be guerrilla war between now and the next election. And uh, LePage is going to be. Um, outmaneuvering uh, the majorities. But before you comment on that, <laughs> let's take a look at the two parties right now, because I think they both have um, uh, really huge structural problems um, uh, that are going to be very difficult for them to fix before the next election. 
Do you agree? I, I don't. I don't think Democrats have as big a problem as Republicans do. And, and to circle back to the earlier point, yeah. the pages are relevant in terms of do, forward moving, doing something. He's not irrelevant in terms of stopping things, the veto power and the, and the firm majority in the House. We just saw it. But that wasn't a vote that requires two thirds. Mm -hmm. But even in a vote that requires 51% of both sides, they can play negative. They can stop things. So he's not irrelevant in that sense and never has been and, and won't be. In fact, mm -hmm. as Bill points out, he'd probably try to do more of it, yeah. if, it if that's possible. But in terms of here's an agenda, here's something proactive we want to do, I, I don't think they can do it. I don't think he mm -hmm. can do any of that. So, I, I, To get to your question about the, the, the two parties, I, I agree with Alan that I think that going into this cycle, and I'm talking primarily about the race for governor and, of course, the legislature going into 2018, um, I think that if, if we are correct in foreseeing this second half, you know, uh, you know, just all-out warfare in Augusta. I think that as long as they don't blow it, that's going to play very well for the for the Democrats looking ahead to November of 2018, because it will be right there in the election cycle, in front of people's faces. All hell will be breaking loose up there, and the Democrats will be in the enviable position of saying, "Look, this is what eight years." has begotten. Do you really want to keep going down this path? So I think that from a messaging standpoint, the Democrats stand to benefit uh, more than the Republicans because the Republicans are going to be the source of all the friction and all the strife. The tricky part is for the Democrats to do this without blowing it right. and to not get caught up in their own, you know, intramural battles and things that could undermine that. I, I think that they hung together in this budget process and, you know, I really do uh, hope for their sake that they have the good sense to do that going into the election. I think the, the problem they have is that they've got a, a very activist base, and this is true nationally of Democrats, um, that the people who really um, are the most, the most Democratic Democrats want big changes and elected officials are uh, much more likely to compromise. And, and we saw this play out here with a 3% where uh, the uh, people at the table at the end, um, particularly, I guess, the speaker, Sarah Gideon, um, was ready to trade off that 3% um, surtax when um, that makes uh, a lot of the core Democrats, Democratic voters unhappy. And um, it's unclear, I think, uh, if there's if there's people not on the fence of whether I should vote Democrat or Republican, but whether I should vote at all. Um, uh, what is the message of the Democrats that we're going to do a better job? We're going to be more, more uh, efficient. We're going to be uh, smarter. You know, it doesn't have the same resonance as we're going to tax the rich and take, give your kid a great education. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's where they're going to run into problems. And uh, I don't necessarily see any of the, uh, uh, well, uh, the gubernatorial candidates that have announced so far, Adam Cody, um, who else on the Democratic side? Who's announced? Well, Janet Mills has all been announced. All but announced. Yeah. Not really a favorite of that group, right? No. There's not, neither, anybody, neither, one of, neither one of those right. are, are like a progressive uh, flag bearer. Right. There's nobody, and there's nobody coming out of the legislature, so Janet is probably the closest to that. Right you know, now, they say Mark is. Eves is, a, is a, yeah. in that same right. class, right. and then uh, right. uh, Betsy Sweet, who, um, in a lot of ways, uh, you, would think, you would think it would yeah. she would not be the ideal candidate. She's right. like a like a uh, you know herbal healer, and she does uh, has a meditation business, and she's. Um, um, but she was a big progressive leader for a long she's time, been, and she is. And so yeah. she'll play. She will. She'll play the outsider on the left, right? I think. And she'll uh, speak to that group, that that sort of dis disaffected yeah. group. Um, I, I'm just not convinced that that group can win a general election, though. That's the problem. Right. I mean, that's right. the challenge that the Democrats face, because I just don't think that, you know, as as much as that message, tax the rich and pay for fill in the blank, mm -hmm. resonates with that segment of the Democratic Party. I think we've, it's been demonstrated time after time that when it comes to the, you know, the, the body politic here in Maine. Uh, that message falls short. It's interesting that it does because very often the people who oppose it 
are not uh, opposing it out of self-interest. In fact, they're working against their own interests mm -hmm. by opposing it. Uh, but nevertheless, that's, that's the state of play right now. So I think that the Democrats, it, I, I, pragmatically, I think they would make, it would be a mistake for them to rush into this election. Uh, Cynthia's not here today, yeah, yeah. Know, waving Bernie banners. You know, I, right. I just don't think that, that that's going to win them any election in Maine. So on the Republican side, um, you see the split between the House and Senate, and and Cynthia last week described it as kind of a um, an institutional um, different point of view of the world, but it really seems to to talk to two very different groups: the the uh, the Tea Party, uh, LePage, uh, you know, My Way or the Highway uh, groups digging in their heels in the House, and then the uh, more moderate uh, Mike Thibodeau, very conservative guy, very conservative economically. Um, but a businessman who, who wants the state to succeed. And, uh, you know, Roger Cates, uh, another very moderate uh, deal maker. Uh, and, um, you know, how you said um, um, you have to be able to win a general election. Well, for those guys, you have to be able to win a primary. Right. And can you get past the, the fire breathing dragons right. uh, and win a primary right. and get a candidate like that out? Uh, it's, I think that's the problem that faces both parties. Right now, you, you know, I mean, who shows up and votes in primaries? Who's active, you know? And, and there's a difference in the pattern between the two parties over the last couple of major cycles, as I see it. Republican fire-breathing dragons want a ideological outsider and no one else. They right. don't want Cates. They don't want Peter Mills. They don't want anybody who might appear to be moderate and we could argue it would be more electable statewide, but they just had success with that strategy twice. Democrats, on the other hand, the, the fire-breathing dragons on the Democratic side in the primaries have been people who want an insider, who want a safe, somebody's been around a long time, we know where they stand. And so there's a different sort of uh, guarding of the fortress on the two parties. Um, and, you know, the far right has essentially become the inside, has essentially taken over the party. That hasn't happened on the left. Well, so how do, you, how do you tell um, a left-wing Democrat that um, they should, uh, you know, keep their powder dry and go with a, uh, a moderate uh, after losing two elections uh, with that strategy? Well, I, th I don't think left uh, center is the way it's defined. It's inside or outside. And, and okay. in that, More. In that re on that note, I think that that's what makes a candidacy like Cody's so fascinating because he is moderate. Some, you know, some would consider him too far for the way too far to the right for some of these. You know, well, we don't know any of his positions. Right. Uh, well, he has. He has, so far, he has. It's, that's, it's, that's, that's his reputation. That's but but yeah. again, but he seems moderate. He like he looks like a moderate person. <laughs> he speaks like right. a moderate but person. But to Alan's point, he's an outsider. Yes. And, and yeah, yeah. I think that you might be touching on something really important here, and that is everybody, everybody wants a break. If you are somebody who is really completely unsullied by this and has no history with any of these people and you know speaks intelligently eventually lays out issues yeah. i think that uh it's a pretty good position to be in if you can get through the gauntlet if you can get and, but it's know. the same problem with the republicans that you mentioned Greg. right you got to win the primary and that's where yeah. a guy like cody if that's you look, where his biggest you look at the pattern is. of recent elections janet mills will be the nominee right that's the way they've gone Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, that, it, that doesn't mean she'll win the general election or can or would be the best candidate. That's another matter. But it's going to be tough for Adam Cody. And, uh, and what will the fading light of a LePage administration um, where eyes are turning elsewhere, what actions will he take to get attention during the next year to draw attention away from the campaign? How will that affect the campaign? Right. Oh, and... Brush fire behind the blade. Right. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, and, like... and here's another big factor at work, which is hard to anticipate what it's going to go. The Trump factor, I think, is going to be big in the 2018 election. Right. And the, there's going to be a remorse wave. But also, talk about, you know, looking at craziness and wanting to move away from craziness. I mean, there it is. And it's, it's not going away. Right. If anything, it's going to get right. worse. And if, if he spikes a downturn in the economy... Between now and next June, 
I mean, that will be mm-hmm. in play in yeah, every right. state in a way point. that it normally isn't. Right. Yeah. So um, we spent a lot of time uh, looking at the budget and thinking about the budget and talking about the budget, but um, there was about 2,000 bills out in front of the legislature this year, and um, and some of them passed. Um, I think I read uh, 600 something passed, uh, which is a fairly low number. Uh, among the things that um, didn't pass was any uh, improvement to our um, response to the opioid crisis. Uh, excellent story, but today by um, mm-hmm. or yesterday by Eric Russell about um, how it came about that they that there was a, a statewide consensus that this was a terrible thing, and they just could not um, do anything to address it. This is a classic case where you know everybody in January and December were, on both sides were say, they were all saying the right thing. We had those startling year-end figures for the number of opioid-related deaths. Um, it was a call to action. And, and then, of course, we, the Press Herald did, did our series, which I think really shined a much brighter light on the problem. But in the end, if you look at the people Eric talked to, starting with the governor, but others, uh, and if you look in the comments, you'll see one thing has not changed. Half the world, or more, sees opioid addiction as a sign of bad character, as, a, as criminal activity, as the kind of thing, to quote, the, to paraphrase the governor, everybody should just be throwing in the slammer for and they can figure it out there. Mm-hmm. And then you have another segment of society that looks at, the, at the addiction to opioids, much like they look at addiction to alcohol or other things, as, as essentially you know, a disorder, a disease that can and must be treated. Uh, it from a lot of different directions in order for people to recover from it. And I think that's what hasn't changed. You know, there's still that moral judgment that's being passed by a whole lot of people about people who are addicted. And as long as that is the case, you're going to be very hard pressed to get those people to actually pony up the kind of money that we're talking about to really address this problem. Right. And add to that this element, uh, Cynthia talked about this last week, so of uh, particularly on the Republican side, the element that wants government dismantled. They don't want to spend any money. That's what's driving, in many ways, the health care debate in Washington right now. you got a group that just doesn't want to spend money. And it doesn't matter what the rationale is. doesn't matter how many millions or hundreds of thousands of people are going to be adversely affected. They do not want to spend money. And, and so you run into that as well. So you get the moral uh, differences, and then you get this group that, I don't care. It's I'm not, just not yeah. spending any right. money, and I want taxes down, and I want government smaller. That's it, mm-hmm. bottom line. And that's a minority, but it's a mi- minority with inordinate power mm-hmm. right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I see from uh, the letters to the editor and the comments that we get uh, – we're in a situation where there's some really strong beliefs on both sides, or, or I don't want to say both sides because it's not all uh, uh, bifurcated, but there are very strong opposing beliefs that um, nobody has a majority for. Right. You know, um, it, it comes up with uh, with healthcare, like the people who say, "Let's just get the government completely out of healthcare." Uh, and I don't think they know exactly how far that would that would mean going to, like getting yeah. rid of your tax exemption for your uh, for yeah. your uh, yeah. you know employer supply plan. Yeah. And then you have people who want the government to run the whole health care program. And, uh, and that's why I think we end up with these uh, half measures and kind of lurching left and right without ever really uh, doing uh, going anybody's program all the way. Um, and uh, it's. Uh, it's, I think we saw a lot of that this session, that, that, that there just is not enough um, uh, muscle behind uh, LePage's uh, agenda. And, uh, and he will just stop it, anybody else from trying to do their agenda, but he can't uh, achieve what he wants to achieve. And, you know, in general, I think that's a pretty good thing. But um, uh, we're, we're stuck with a situation where uh, his people are walking away saying, you know, we couldn't do it because they wouldn't let us. Mm-hmm. The same as, as our side is. Uh, and, not, and, not our side, but the, both, the other side. Both sides are claiming 
that they're, they I don't have host, a side. They were the hostages. I said all those mean you things know, about the no, Democrats. I was taken hostage. Right. No, I was taken hostage. I mean, right, right. Really, the whole system was being taken hostage by the inability to find common ground. I did some research on hostage taking for my last column, and uh, apparently, like none of this is hostage taking because hostage takers are really rational. Right. And they, um, right. they, they are really interested in keeping the hostages alive, right. and uh, they want to get out. And uh, well, this is something else. This is just this sort is just of a, a crazy guy with a gun. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, a, it's a barricade with victims uh, right. situation. Right. Right. Um, anyway, there was a lot of other stuff out, left out there. Um, uh, one of the big ones is uh, rank choice voting. Yeah, and here we go. I mean, this is you know, it, for, for the political scientists, this night, 2018 is going to be one heck of a year. Because we're going to have ranked choice no matter what for, with the primaries because they're not affected by the constitutional concerns anyway. So that's a given. But right now, the way it stands, uh, the ranked choice law was not repealed. It is in the same shape and form it was right now as when the voters passed it. So if nothing happens going into the 2018 general election, um, we're going to be, you know, heading pell-mell for, for the courts right after the election, assuming, of course, that it's a three-way race and one of the candidates is sufficiently aggrieved that they're going to take it to court. Well, I suppose they could have a special uh, uh, session, right, and they could uh, repeal it all the way. That's certainly all they need they is could. majority votes for that, and certainly the governor would sign that. But they or didn't have the that they didn't, didn't have the votes for it this, the time. Votes this time. Or they could um, uh, pass a constitutional amendment that would go to the voters. So that would be an interesting thing where you um, uh, would be voting in a ranked choice election and voting on a constitutional amendment to allow ranked choice voting. And they, they could throw in a competing measure too. Yeah, 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 measure. right. <laughs> um, so Alan, er, early in this process, a couple of years ago, uh, you were not a fan of ranked choice voting because you, I, I, maybe I'm remembering this wrong because you thought it was subject to this kind of uh, uh, attack that it was gonna be, you could you paint it as too complicated and that you were more supportive of, a, of some kind of a runoff or, or, runoff or, a, or a group yeah. primary, yeah. jungle primary. Um, any idea that, that something like that could emerge out of this? I, I don't think something like that could happen unless the possibility of ranked choice voting being fixed is eliminated. So you have a vote to change the Constitution, that vote fails. Then I think you have to go to what those folks consider to be Plan B which is uh, some version of a, ideally a September open primary with the last two going in November. That would be, it has its imperfections also, but it's a heck of a lot better than what we have right now. But so, you know, I like ranked choice voting. I've been a supporter. Just wasn't my, it wouldn't be my, it wouldn't have been my first choice. But n now we, uh, you know, being better than the system we have in place. If the primaries invoke rank choice, which I assume they will, uh, and it goes off without a hitch, then I wonder how much effect that's going to have going into November. Again, we, it, it, it implies or it assumes in November that there is going to be a situation where rank choice would be invoked. Uh, and if there isn't, then it's moot. I haven't talked to a single Portland voter who told me that they were confused by a ranked choice ballot, uh, even when there were, I think, 11 candidates. Um, I, I just don't think, I think going through the exercise, if anybody, you know, if it is in place for primaries, I think a lot of the uh, the fear about it being That's my too point. confusing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. A lot of the, you know, yeah, you know, the world is ending. Yeah, I don't think it's a problem for the voters. I don't think that's yeah, yeah. the issue. The issue is the constitutionality of it. And in a primary, all it takes is one candidate, either the winner or the second place candidate, who has who has been subjected to ranked choice voting, to go to the courts and seek a, an emergency but, injunction. But they'd have no standing because there would be nothing. The only standing that they would have in the general election would be that this violates the main constitution. But you can't do that in a primary because the constitution is silent on primaries. So they would have a hard time, I think, uh, establishing standing with the court. The court would say, the court would simply say, that's the law. Tough luck. You lose. The voters passed this thing. And they don't have that fallback argument, which you do in the general saying, no, Your Honor, look, this is what the main constitution says. Mm. It only says that 
about general state elections. Yeah. So if that's the if that's the case, and if, and it is, then you get to the general. Right. You elect somebody by rank choice who wasn't the winner in the first ballot. You're in court the next day. Yep. The whole thing is yep. claimed uh, null and void. Or actually, I suspect what the courts would say is whoever won the plurality in that race is the winner, which might not be what the ranked choice winner is. Mm -hmm. So and then it run gets a, to how, do you run, how do you run a campaign? How, how would you change your behavior? You know, if it's first past the post, you're, yeah. you're identifying just your voters. You know, you're not worried about uh, insulting anybody else. Everybody loves the independent. Right, right. <laughs> well, okay. So this is, a, this is a story we will not get the end of today. No, but it's going to be fascinating. It, it's, it really it is. is. If, I, if I were teaching a poli-sci course at one of the universities, I mean, I would be building a course around this yeah. Yeah. next year because I think it's, it, as a study in the electoral process and all the you know, competing forces therein, I think mm -hmm. this, is, this is one for the ages. Yeah. And I think uh, especially, you know, we talked about this before, but in an era of declining parties, uh, you need some other way to um, to coalesce, you know, bring bring groups together. And uh, that's something the parties used to do, and, and they're less good at it than they used to be. But we're still good at it, and uh, we'll be back at this <laughs> really soon. Good too. Don't stay inside. Don't forget your sunscreen. Enjoy. This is a Press Herald podcast. You can hear past episodes at pressherald.com slash podcasts. You can subscribe on iTunes, on Android devices, and stream on Stitcher. Please email comments and questions to letters to the editor at pressherald.com. Thank you for listening. <laughs>